Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Kim Strom, and I'm the director of the Office of Ethics and Policy here at Carolina, and I'm also the Smith P. Thiemann uh, Professor of Ethics and Practice here at the School of Social Work. So two of my lives and homes are uh, coinciding in tonight's talk. We're really grateful um, for your uh, interest in being here and for the opportunity to offer this presentation. October is Global Ethics Month and we're celebrating ethics in action um, in our office. And I wanna um, acknowledge our staff and interns for all of the work that they've done and also acknowledge uh, the PAR Center for Ethics and the uh, Institute of Arts and Humanities for their help in promoting this session and uh, the law school for providing a reception afterwards. So we hope that you'll be able to stay and engage in conversation for what will undoubtedly be a thought-provoking presentation. We're also very fortunate, <coughs> most fortunate, to have Eric Mueller here. Mueller here. The one thing I wasn't supposed to mess up. <laughs> um, I give deep thanks to Eric for his research in this uh, topic area, part of which we're going to hear about tonight, and also for his willingness to come and share it. Uh, Eric is a professor at the law school and also, um, as you can see, the director of a really important and innovative fellowship program helping um, uh, professionals or students to prepare for uh, their their roles as professionals by understanding what roles their professions had in the Holocaust. Um, Eric Eric's work, in in addition to the topics he'll be talking about tonight, also includes uh, examination of uh, the internment of Japanese citizens uh, during World War II, and has written two really compelling books in, in that area. And um, a really important through point uh, in tonight's talk and that work to me is the role of, of courage and also the role of, of pressures um, that uh, can incrementally affect uh, people's ability to carry out their professions with justice and um, with integrity. So. Without further ado, I want to thank my friend, colleague, and mentor, uh, Eric Muller, for being here, and I will turn him over to you. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Is this good in the back? Is the volume okay? Great. So uh, I wanted to also thank all of you for coming out uh, on a uh, Monday afternoon for a talk about Nazis. Um, uh, I promise you it will, uh, I won't say it'll be happy, but I do think it'll be interesting and challenging. And my hope is that it'll actually help us think not just about the past, but about the present and the future, and not just think about the Nazis, but also the much harder task of thinking about ourselves uh, and the roles that we play in our own lives. Um, I did uh, absolutely want to start out by thanking Kim uh, Strom uh, and the Office of Ethics and Policy, a very important uh, organ of the university that sort of moves behind the scenes and under the radar. It's a quiet office, but a very, very important office uh, focusing our attention on our ethical lives in the university. Uh, also, um, Associate Director Jennifer Daniel and the interns, including especially Olivia Robertson have been wonderfully helpful in preparing today's event, so thank you very much for the opportunity. So I'm going to start this talk um, in a little bit of an odd place. It's a place that I haven't started. I've given versions of this talk before, and I have not started it here, but it seemed the right thing to do. Um, uh, it, it, I'm starting actually, rather than in Germany, I'm going to start in the United States, and I'm going to start about three months ago. Um, Back in the mid-1980s, uh, there was a lawsuit brought on behalf of migrants from Central America, uh, uh, I believe it was El Salvador at that time, um, who were trying to come into the United States, trying to seek asylum, and under the rules that were being changed and implemented by the Reagan administration, uh, their uh, treatment in detention 
uh, was, uh, to their minds, objectionable. Uh, and so they filed a lawsuit. And the lawsuit went under the name of Flores. The, the lead plaintiff's was, last name was Flores. That litigation was filed in 1985. It wasn't actually settled until the Clinton administration, uh, 1997. Uh, the parties settled, right? So the, the plaintiffs and the U.S. government, the Ju Justice Department, entered into a settlement agreement of, those, of that lawsuit. And uh, under the settlement agreement, the government undertook to do a number of things, but a couple of them had to do with children. Uh, in particular, they guaranteed, the government promised in this settlement that it would ensure safe and sanitary conditions for children who were migrants and in detention. Safe and sanitary conditions. That was what the government undertook as part of this settlement with the plaintiffs. The court system retained jurisdiction over the case, though, to make sure that it was implemented and continues to be implemented. And that judicial supervision continues today. So that's what you need to know in order to understand the clip that I'm about to show you. Uh, you're about to see uh, about maybe two and a half, three minutes from an oral argument that took place in the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in San Francisco back in June. Uh, you are going to see a panel on the top. You'll see a panel of three judges. Uh, and then at the bottom, you'll see the uh, U.S. Justice Department uh, Immigration Litigation Unit attorney, whose name is Sarah Fabian. Uh, so I think what I'll do is just play the clip and then uh, try to help contextualize it for this talk about Nazi Germany, something that it's always important to do when talking about Germany and uh, the Nazis. Is that, I'm hearing a hum, is that uh, my equipment? Is it okay? Am I good? Okay. So there we have the three judges, um, and this is Sarah Fabian. Remember, the issue in the case is whether the conditions that were being provided at one of the migrant detention centers for children uh, met that standard of safe and sanitary conditions. Um, it's interesting to note, just if you're interested in biography, that Ms. Fabian had, I might, think you might say, the misfortune of uh, getting as one of the judges on the panel of three, uh, this judge, a uh, man whom I know and admire greatly, his name is Wallace Tashima, and he spent three years of his childhood at the Poston Relocation Center for Japanese American citizens during World War II. So he was a child in U.S. detention early in his life. So let's just listen. It runs about two and a half minutes. And, and that's any number of things might fall under those categories. And I think yes, I, but, can... but sleep surely does. Right, you can't be safe and 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 sanitary or safe as a human being if you can't sleep. Well, and and you said in your briefs it doesn't say anything about sleeping, so therefore um, there's nothing in here about being able to sleep. I think the concern there is, Your Honor, the court finding that sleep, for example, falls under is relevant to a finding of of no safe and sanitary conditions is one thing, but the ultimate conclusion is. Safe and sanitary is a singular category in the agreement, and it was, it was, one has to assume left that way and not enumerated by the parties because either the parties couldn't reach agreement on how to enumerate that, or that it was left to the agencies to deter, to determine. Or really. it was relatively obvious, uh, and it's least obvious enough so that if you're putting to people into a crowded room to sleep on a concrete floor with an aluminum foil blanket on top of them, that doesn't comply with the agreement. I mean, it may be that they don't get super thread counts Egyptian linens. I get that. But the testimony that the district judge believed was it's really cold. In fact, it gets colder when we complain about it being cold. We're supposed to sleep crowded with the lights on all night long. Uh, and all you to put us on is the concrete floor with an aluminum blanket. I mean, I understand it's some outer boundary. There may be some definitional difficulty, but no one would argue that this is secure and sanitary, or safe, uh, safe and sanitary. Or at least I don't think you're arguing that, are you? Your Honor, I think what I'm arguing is that, that the, the way that the district court reached the conclusion was to say 
these these specific items. And, and I, I think I, I will acknowledge, I think sleep is, is the more difficult end of what I'm arguing. To me, it's more like, as Judge Fletcher says, it's within everybody's common understanding that, you know, if you don't have a toothbrush, if you don't have soap, if you don't have a blanket, it's not safe and sanitary. Well, wouldn't everybody agree to that? You, do you agree to that? Well, I, I think it's, I think those are, there's fair reason to find that those things may be part of safe no, and sanitary. maybe, are a part. What do you say maybe? You mean there are circumstances when a person doesn't need to have a, a toothbrush, toothpaste, and soap for days? Well, I, I think in, in CBP custody, there's freq it's frequently intended to be much shorter term. So it may be that for a shorter term stay in CBP custody that some of those things may not be required. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think that was the situation that the court was confronting. I mean, it wasn't right. as though those people were there for 12 hours and then moved on to the Hilton Hotel. No, they were there for a fairly, fairly sustained period. So that's just a little flavor of what Sarah Fabian argued to the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and how that argument was received with uh, incredulity, I think you can see. Why am I starting this talk with that clip? Um, it's not to analogize detention centers at our border with death camps or slave labor camps or concentration camps run by the Nazis. That's not the argument uh, that I'm making. I'm not making any comparison of Nazi Germany to the United States. That's not what it's about either. What I'm interested in and what I'm focusing on is the attorney, Sarah Fabian. We don't know much about her, but I think we can say one thing with assurance, and that is that she did not go to law school so that she could stand up in a court and argue that children in immigration detention shouldn't have blankets or a place to sleep or a toothbrush. I mean, who would go to law school to argue that? So that's the question that we're really pursuing this afternoon. What is it that leads a person like Sarah Fabian, who undoubtedly went to law school with some of the same idealistic aspirations that most of us who go to law school do, what is it that leads her and others, professionals, not just lawyers? What is it that leads people who are not monsters to end up embedded in indecent systems? This is not about the Trump administration. Sarah Fabian back in 2015 in the same job at the Justice Department under Barack Obama argued that it didn't violate the Flores conditions for children to be held in solitary confinement. That was under the Bush administration, I'm sorry, under the Obama administration. It's not just about lawyers. I mean, I'm talking about law and lawyers in Nazi Germany, but this underlying question, how do decent people end up staffing in decent systems? is a question that we could be asking, for example, about graduates of business school, right? There are major corporations who are bidding on the contract to construct these facilities, to police them, to maintain them, to do sanitation at them. There are journalism school graduates who are now working for agencies doing public relations, helping to sugarcoat this system. So this isn't just about lawyers. This is about how Decent people end up in indecent systems. Now, you might be saying right now, but wait, Eric, this is about Nazis, and yet you're talking about decent people ending up staffing in decent systems. Um, and uh, how, so what is it that could possibly lead someone to think that this Nazi analogy could be useful? And on this point, I really want to invite us this afternoon to think about this as historians. Think about the issue of Nazi Germany and the role of professionals in Nazi Germany the way a historian would. That is to say, to think about it as time moving forward rather than time moving backward. We today look back on Nazi Germany, we look back on the lawyers who helped to run that system, and we cannot help but look at it through the lens of Auschwitz. We can't help but do that. We know where this ended up. They didn't. 
So if you were a lawyer in Nazi Germany in 1933 or 34 or 35 or 36 or seven, all the way through the 1930s, you didn't know where this ended up. You knew no more about tomorrow than we know today about our own tomorrows. The future was choices. They were facing choices about how they wanted to live their lives. They were obviously facing choices under some very difficult conditions. But this notion that Nazi Germany was a place without choice, where people lived in a top-down terror state that if they did took the tiniest step off of a kind of decreed path, they would end up up against the wall of a shooting range or at Dachau. That is a gross misconception, a gross misconception of the way Nazi Germany actually worked. And I think you'll see by the end of the talk this afternoon that people in fact did have degrees of freedom in their jobs as professionals. They made choices just like we do. So yes, I am talking about how decent people end up staffing decent systems. Uh, and I do think, and I hope you'll agree, that the uh, analogy works at least to some extent. Okay. This, uh, obviously we all know who this is on the left. Here in the uh, middle, um, we have a quotation from Adolf Hitler from around 1940, I believe this was. Uh, I shall not rest until every German sees that it is shameful to be a lawyer. And so I'd like to stop here and actually invite you, a few ideas from you about why it is that you think Adolf Hitler might have had as such a key aspiration for Germans to understand it was shameful to be a lawyer. And apparently we have this fun little device. This is a microphone that I can, or that Kim, can hand or even toss, because it's soft, to people uh, to answer the question, why do you think that Adolf Hitler would have said, I won't rest until everyone understands the shame of being a lawyer? In the back there, thank you. Um, oh, that does work. Um, it does. So I think part of it is that like the sort of like social ideology of being a lawyer and attorney in a system is to socially constrain it in some way, especially the lawyers or like the right or whatever that constrained Hitler's initial moves to power. They were largely law graduates in Germany and people that told him no. So the suggestion is that uh, lawyers would have brought with them some package of commitments and ideals that would be inconsistent with uh, Hitler's approach to what a state is. Great suggestion. Other ideas? Why would other, or either to supplement that or perhaps to disagree with it, why would Hitler have thought it was shameful to be a lawyer? I mean, you guys might think it's shameful to be a lawyer too, but that's different. That's not what I'm talking about. Any other suggestions or thoughts? I guess it might also be considered shameful because lawyers are advocates for individual clients. So the lawyers themselves aren't necessarily beholden to any particular ideologies. They don't have to be consistent and that might have been considered shameful to someone with a very purportedly consistent ideology. That's a great suggestion as well. Um, and these are both, I think, right on target. Um, Hitler um, disliked lawyers in part because they represented a tradition and a kind of locus of respect and authority and power that was independent of the state, something I'm gonna say a few more words about in a couple of minutes, and also because the substance of what they did was oriented in the enlightenment way we would expect towards the rights of the individual, towards the conception of the idea that a person could have a right against the state. This for Adolf Hitler obviously is um, anathema. And yet, and yet, Adolf Hitler also insisted upon the forms of legality. So it was a paradox. He both hated lawyers and the law, but he also insisted on maintaining the shell of law, the appearance 
of legal process. And one of the best illustrations of this tension that we're talking about here is in this photograph on the right, which I'll explain to you. The man in the middle there wearing the uniform, or one of the men wearing the uniforms anyway, um, is uh, Hans Carroll. Uh, he was the justice minister of the state of Prussia. Uh, and and part uh, uh, and, a, and and a Nazi and a member of the national wing Nazi state at the time that this photograph was taken, which was August of 1933. Hitler came to power at the end of January in 1933. So this is during that first year when there was still sort of the remnants, even the structures of prior. German legal life and social life that was coming to be in conflict with and overtaken by the Fuhrer's will, a new system grounded not in those old understandings, but in these, this new understanding. Where he is speaking, trust, uh, the Prussian justice minister is speaking at sort of a boot camp for lawyers in training in the town of Juteborg, which is about an hour south of Berlin. And in order to welcome him, the members of the local bar, the, the local bar and these training lawyers have constructed this little welcoming device, which you can see here. Uh, it's gallows. And can, can you see what's hanging from the, what are they hanging there? Does anyone, again, we can, I, you can just shout it out, it's just a, you know, or we can use the mic if you like. What is being hanged? there to welcome the Prussian justice minister? Anyone recognize what that is? It looks, you might think that it's the SS or something like related to the SS because they do look like two S's. In fact, they sort of are two S's, but it's not the SS. Maybe this will help at least the lawyers or law students in the room. What's that? It's a section sign from a statute. It's a symbol of law. It's a symbol of statutory law. It's a symbol of positive law. So how are they greeting him? They are greeting him by hanging in effigy their commitment to positive law, their, uh, to, to, to the notion of a state defined by a rule of law. That's a heck of a way for a bunch of lawyers to be welcoming a justice minister. So this was a time when we see these tensions that during this early months and even years, one, one, one might say, of the Nazi project, we see these tensions, these, this battle between two alternatives. And these are three different ways of conceptualizing this battle um, in three sort of slightly different philosophical frameworks. They all are kind of doing a similar thing. They're all, if this, were the, if this were the philosophy department, somebody would come up and drag me off the stage for suggesting that these are related as much as they are. But uh, for our purposes, I think we can uh, think of it this way. Um, we might think of the prior regime as a, as they, the German philosophers call it, a Recht, state based in the rule of law, versus uh, the Unrechtsstaat, the a lawless state. Uh, the uh, very well-known um, and important mid-20th century German-Jewish political scientist Ernst Frankel spoke of the battle between the Normenstadt and the Maßnahmenstadt, which is the normative state and the prerogative state. So what these two ideas are getting at is a, the, the tension between a state that is committed to the rule of law that is committed to the idea of antecedent legislation, regulations that are passed by duly authorized bodies that then constrain behavior on the one hand, and on the other hand, a more amorphous, undefined, um, shifting, um, uh, uh, based system, which is ultimately embodied in the will of the Fuhrer under Nazi ideology. Um, this, this one doesn't really believe, belong to be uh, in the same, uh, on the same screen as these two. This is something we talk about 
in American legal systems, right? But it's something, it's catch, capturing something like the same thing. The difference between positive law, statutes passed by Congress, regulations passed by the Environmental Protection Administration, rulings made by common law judges on the one hand, the Constitution, the text of the Constitution on the one hand, that as the source of law, or do we also retain natural rights? Do we retain rights? Do we as individuals retain rights that are not listed in any particular codified thing, but that we have them nonetheless? These are, these are some of the most contentious debates that we have in our society, often under the question of whether the due process clause, which is vague and open and doesn't say anything about abortion or same-sex intimacy, or add to the list, whether nonetheless there is some set of principles that the due process clause sort of aspirationally embodies, which judges can then enforce. So it's that tension between codified, articulated law and this notion of a more free-floating kind of source of law. Germany was deeply, deeply devoted. German jurisprudence was an intensely committed positive law space. The German jurisprudence rejected the notion of natural law. So lawyers entered into this time period very much attached to uh, the notion of law as being um, whatever is expressed by a lawgiver rather than some inherent set of unarticulated, unwritten rights and rules that people retain. That's an important thing to remember. That's why they're hanging the section sign. We are looking at a moment in which law is being unmoored from codifications and being attached to the will of the Fuhrer. When we speak about lawyers in the Third Reich and complicity, you can think of different kinds of complicity. So for example, you might think of lawyers' complicity in what the Nazis defined as racial laws. The, the, the Nazis, of course, saw Jews as a race uh, uh, biologically. So when I say racial, I'm referring to chiefly to, not exclusively, but chiefly to, to Jews. So here we have, uh, from, uh, this is from the New York Times in November of 1935. The headline is, Berlin works out anti-Jewish rules. No date has yet been set for promulgating regulations to enforce recent laws. Who promulgated those? Lawyers did. Subsidiary lawyers, not people at the top. People in the bowels of the bureaucracy were responsible. We're going to meet one of them later were responsible for this and for carrying them through into execution and for cooperating with them and inc incorporating them into uh, enactment. Um, lest we get ourselves too quickly off the hook, I would recommend to you this recent, relatively recent book now by James Whitman, a legal historian up at Yale, um, called Hitler's American Model, something of a shocking title. Um, he argues very persuasively in this book that um, the Nazis took uh, uh, the ideas for many of their racial laws from Jim Crow. In particular, the laws concerning intermarriage, anti-miscegenation laws. There's very good evidence as to those laws that the Nazis looked specifically at the laws that were in force right here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina at that same time. Other varieties of lawyer complicity, the Aryanization process, or Arisierung, as it's said in German. This was a process underway from 33 or 34 all the way through the end of the decade, in which non-Aryan, which is to say Jewish, property was first encouraged and then strongly encouraged and then coerced and then ultimately forcibly transferred from the hands of Jews to the hands of non-Jews, Aryans. So here on the left, we have a, a store. This is from uh, 1939, roughly. Stamm und Bassermann, früher Gummiweil. 
This is the this is the this is right the storefront. It says this is the Stam and Wasserman company. We used to be Gumi Vial. Vial, of course, being one of the most common Germish, German Jewish names. Over here on the right, we have some ads from the from local newspapers. Geschäftsübernahme. Das bekannte Hosenhaus Lachmann jetzt in arischem Besitz. Um, uh, the, 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 the takeover of a store. The well-known um, clothing store Lachmann is now in Aryan ownership. It's in the newspaper. Hermansky, wieder rein Arisch. The Hermansky store is once again pure Aryan. How did these massive occur? Well, lawyers helped with them. Lawyers, lawyers were intimately involved with them. Not in Berlin, not you know, just outside Hitler's office, not up in the Ministry of Justice or the Ministry of the Interior, but in cities and towns across Germany, and then later Austria in 1938. Lots of ways to think about lawyer complicity. And then, of course, we can think about the most egregious lawyer complicity, like that of Dr. Rudolf Lange, uh, Lange um, from the University of Jena in 1933. Didn't join the SS until 1936, but was an ambitious fellow. Uh, by May of 1938, when the Anschluss occurred, that is the Germans rolling into Austria, um, uh, he was placed in charge of annexing onto the German poli police system the Austrian police system. So he's moved pretty far in the space of a couple of years. September of 1940, he is the deputy head of the Gestapo in Berlin. So he continues his meteoric rise. June of 1941, he is transferred to run one of the so-called Einsatzgruppen, Einsatzgruppe A, A. There were a number of them, they were given letter names. Uh, he was sent to Latvia, to Riga in Latvia, to run the Einsatzgruppe. What were the Einsatzgruppen doing? These were mobile killing squads that were following behind the Wehrmacht. In the summer of 1941, Hitler breached the uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and rolled through the agreed upon line with the Soviets into Eastern Europe and towards the Soviet Union. Operation Barbarossa, it was called. As part of that, uh, the Wehrmacht would move forward, and behind them would come these Einsatzgruppen, and they were responsible for rounding up and murdering thousands and thousands of people, political opponents and Jews. So in November of 1941, Rudolf Lange, with his law degree from the University of Jena, uh, oversees and personally participates in the shooting execution into pits of 24,000 Latvian Jews who had been removed from the Riga ghetto. That's a kind of lawyer complicity, but obviously a very different kind. So how can we think about these different kinds of complicity? Where are they coming from? To do this, we have to roll the clock back, and I just want to take a couple of minutes and very quickly talk with you about the history of the German bar up to the point that the Nazis come to power. Uh, because that's important to understand that history. It's a little bit like the history of the American bar, but it's also significantly different, and so we need to get our hands around that. So um, this is 1848, what we would call Germany today. Uh, those of you who are students of European history know that there was no such thing as Germany in 1848. What there was was lots and lots of independent and sometimes affiliated principalities, states, duchies, uh, kingdoms, and so on, um, I believe. And it was something of a, a mess, really. I mean, it was not a coordinated thing. So this is just zooming in on one little section of the map, and you can see this jigsaw of jurisdictions uh, that, again, might have been affiliated in some way, but they each were independent from the other. Um, it was a time of bureaucratic government. Government was largely done by bureaucracy. There wasn't really an idea of sort of representative legislatures. There was royalty and there was the aristocracy. And the, bureauc a bureau the bureaucracy was the body that kind of mediated the relationship between those two uh, sources of power and authority. Um, law was uh, the most respected of the university disciplines, just as it is today, I would say. 
Um, and the civil service, the bureaucracy, was dominated by the aristocracy, by the German aristocracy. Um, it, was very it was a very closed circle. Um, lawyers in what would become Germany tended to play very circumscribed roles, uh, nothing like what we recognize as lawyering today, roles that were identified by the state. Um, they did not tend to play the role of being advisors to biz businesses, mediators of conflict, consultants or agents for business people, politicians. That was already common in the United States. It was co relatively common in the United Kingdom. It was not at all, that role was not what they did. They did specific targeted tasks that were typically assigned by, uh, by the local sovereign. Um, and there was also, and it's very important, there were strictly defined limits on the number of people who could become lawyers. Uh, the phrase that was used for this was a Latin phrase called numerus clausus, closed number. So there were specific numbers of people who were permitted to become lawyers in many, most of the states, including the largest one, this one, which was Prussia. Lawyers were subject to discipline in the mid 19th century. Local, their individual states. The first appearance of an organization of lawyers seeking change came about mid-century uh, across the German states with a national vision, a unifying vision. Uh, this 1848, of course, was the year of Republican revolution across much of the continent, right? So as part of that in Germany, lawyers began uh, speaking up and wanting to, uh, seeking to, to sort of gather together uh, and develop their own standards, uh, their own self-regulation. Um, and so we had the appearance in 18, round then, of something called the Deutsche Anwaltverein, the, the Organization of German Lawyers. First time really uh, that, that a, the notion of a kind of national German lawyering body emerges. And they're advocating for something they call freie Advokatur, free advocacy. They want to free their task, their role from this, these constraints. Uh, they want to be their own source of their own authority, their own um, professional self-definition, uh, their own regulation, their own discipline. Uh, these are all objectives of Freie Advokatur, separating it from the state, uh, uh, and uh, uh, that was what appeared at that time. Didn't make a whole lot of headway, um, as was true across much of Europe where this revolutionary movement was occurring. Um, conservative control was reestablished by the uh, aristocracy, but these organizations, this idea was now afoot, and the organization was there. There were some others as well. Uh, and so you see advocacy for the law as a free profession. This is a very important um, defense of this Freie Advokatur by Rudolf Gneist. Uh, and he says in this, in this treatise, the free practicing bar means nothing less than the precondition for all independence of communal life, of self-government, of constitutional life on the largest scale. So you can see how the definition of the lawyer's role is being linked to and seen as integral to this uh, wave of reform, societal reform, that's, uh, that is uh, bubbling across Europe and across Germany. Well, Germany goes from the jigsaw puzzle uh, that we saw before to something much more like what we know today in 1871. So the, you can see how so many of these, this is 1848, that's 1871. You can see that many of these small entities have either been completely subsumed within mostly Prussia or Bavaria, uh, and those that have not agreed to come together in the uh, modern, what we call them, I guess the modern German state. 1871 is when that occurs. The first profession that becomes subject to um, uh, legislative action is lawyers. Lawyer, just as an illustration of how central lawyers were to the project, uh, the lawyers are the first to get their own recognition in law 
in this 1878 law for the regulation of lawyers. And what did that do? It prioritized the idea of local bar associations. This was something that was far, would have been far into a mid 19th century or even late 19th century, approaching late 19th century uh, lawyer, the idea that there would be local bar associations that would have authority over you um, uh, and that you would be a member of. Um, that was one of these reforms in 1871. Those local entities were given control over discipline. Of, of, of the lawyers that were in that jurisdiction. They abolished the numerous clausus. Big deal, right? Now, there is no fixed number who can become lawyers. And as you can imagine, the, no, the number of lawyers begins to rise. They create a unified fee schedule. This sounds like anathema to American lawyers, of course, but this was seen, this was seen as a major reform uh, for, for German lawyers, a kind of guarantee of certain levels of income uh, for specific legal services. Even more importantly, they articulate this principle of Anwaltszwang, or mandatory representation. So now, in order to plead a case in court, you need to be represented by a lawyer. That was not the case before. And there was a significant liberalization of the criteria for bar admission. So uh, it was not liberal by our current standards, but it was the doors to um, membership in the bar open at this, in roughly this time period to people who simply have the requisite educational qualifications and can afford to support themselves through a couple years worth of unpaid internship. Now that's not gonna be everybody, obviously, uh, but it's opening the door to lots more than the conventional aristocratically uh, dominated pool. Also, it's interesting to note that the late 19th century already women were becoming members of the German bar in very small numbers, but it is also an indication of the way in which uh, the legal profession is uh, opening uh, up. So um, what happens now as we move forward after this law comes into effect? Well, a number of things do. Um, the economics, the thing I mostly wanna mention is the economic situation of attorneys. So the economic situation of attorneys actually begins to suffer as the economy of Germany um, uh, suffers uh, off and on across the late 19th century. Um, there, uh, but through this period of increasing economic stress, the bar having won this free advocacy battle is very loath to give it up. So you might have thought that as the pie is getting smaller that they would say, oh, you know, that numerous clausus, maybe that was a good idea. Maybe, you know, maybe we should be, maybe we should be raised, changing the prices in our fee schedule. They don't do that. They want to remain independent. They prize that more than they prize their own economic well-being. There are periods of inflation across this time period, off and on. And what happens is that the bar continues to grow. In 1880, there are 4,000 lawyers in Germany. Five years later, 4,500. Five years later, 5,200. Five years later, 5,600. So you can see that the ratio is dropping. In ninth, by 1900, there are 6,800 lawyers. And yet, nonetheless, the German Anwaltsverein, the, the German organization of lawyers, um, rejects a numerous clausus. It's proposed and it's rejected. By 1913, there are 12,000 lawyers in Germany. The next period we can speak of uh, is the Weimar period. I'm omitting the war here, right? 1914 to 1918 is World War I. You probably know that the Germans lost World War I. Um, you may also know that the uh, uh, Treaty of Versailles, which ratified the conclusion of the war, imposed extremely burdensome uh, economic and other military, but chiefly economic for our purposes, um, obligations. Uh, this obviously became very important later when Adolf Hitler comes to power. Um, during the Weimar period, eight, 1918, this is the Weimar government, that's why it's called Weimar, um, 
that under that period, which is actually a rapidly changing succession of constantly shifting center, center right, center left, left, center left, center, center left, constantly shifting uh, government arrangements. Why are they shifting so much? Well, there's lots of reasons, right? There's been, uh, the communists have been successful in Russia, right? So uh, we, have the, we have a very strong influence of socialism and communism. Uh, and um, uh, so there are strong political winds blowing back and forth between the right and the left, the right and the left. Uh, and at the same time, we have um, hyperinflation. Uh, nonetheless, the number of lawyers continues to mount. 1925, 13,000, 28, 15,500. By a year or so into the Third Reich, we're up to 19,000 lawyers in Germany. And just to illustrate what the impact would have been of not changing this bar fee schedule, let me show you something that I found last December in my own family's records. Um, this is a postcard that my grandmother in Freiburg, which is in Southern Germany, sent to her brother, whoops, no, don't give it away, that, uh, that uh, she sent to her brother in Lausanne in Switzerland in uh, October, uh, it was on, she sent it on October 19th, 1923. I found this, my brother is the keeper of all the family records. I found this there and I actually counted up how much it cost to send that postcard. I counted up, tallied all of the stamps. And since I've given it away already, I will tell you that it cost 3,600,400 Reichsmarks to send a postcard from Freiburg, Germany to Lausanne, Switzerland. Imagine what the impact of that is on an economy, of course, but also imagine what the impact is on the bar, uh, particularly as the number of lawyers continues to increase. So what does this mean? This makes for turmoil uh, within the bar. By 1934, the average blue collar worker in Germany was earning 2,700 Reichsmarks. 40% of the lawyers in Germany were earning that much, as, as much as a bricklayer, right? 23% at that time were earning half of what a bricklayer would have been. And there were 12% of lawyers who reported no income at all. Try to hold that in mind as you think about what the advent of the Nazis might have meant to you. During the Weimar period, there were um, repeated efforts to um, bring the bar within the control of the state. The bar became less and less effective at resisting those. So already, before Hitler came to power, in the chaos of the Weimar period, the independence of the bar was slipping. And then, of course, oh, I'm sorry, one more thing. Uh, another important piece to remember as you think about the position of the average German lawyer in 1933 is symbolized by this photograph. This is in Berlin, right in front of what's today uh, Humboldt University. There's a big plaza there in front. Uh, and this is a group, uh, this group is the, get the name right, the National Socialist German Students League. This is before the Nazis have come to power. These are students who are out with us underneath a sign that says, down with Versailles, Nieder mit Versailles. These are, these are sort of proto-Nazis and they're students. So we think today of the university as being a bastion of progressive thought, liberalism, something like the closer to the opposite was true in, in universities in Germany. In fact, among the younger generation more generally, why? Well, these, this is a generation, these guys had been too young to go out to war in World War I. They had seen their fathers and their uncles and their brothers, older brothers, not come back from the front or come back shattered in all of the ways that we're familiar with. And they had grown up believing that the chief reason for that was not a military failure, but it was a political failure. It was a failure of will from within inside the state that was largely Jewish dominated. 
there was something of a, um, uh, there, there, were, there were many Jews who were prominent socialists and communists in Germany. This is the origin of the so-called stab in the back myth, right? The military was poised to win World War I on the battlefield, but they were stabbed in the back by Jews and by Jewish dominated uh, political forces within Germany. That's how these young men grew up, with those resentments and those traumas and those losses. This is the symbol of their organization. Obviously in 1933, Hitler comes to power. And what happens to the bar? Well, licensure and discipline, which had been so importantly farmed out to local bar associations, goes to Berlin. It becomes centralized in 1934. Bar admissions had been local. They become centralized, centralized in 1935. The Nazis add new criteria for admission to the bar, uh, a criterion of political awareness, a redefinition of the nature of lawyering as being a legal guardian of the people rather than of an individual client. They significantly lengthened the probationary period. Remember I mentioned those little internships that law recently graduated lawyers needed to do? They turned from two years to four years. Why? So that there can be more ideological sifting of these young lawyers. And of course, they're all required to take an oath of personal loyalty to Adolf Hitler. Grounds for censure and disbarment change. Uh, now, uh, in addition to, you know, sort of taking money out of your client trust account, you can also get censured or disbarred for political offenses, like not giving the requisite salute when the appropriate people came into a room, or what they defined as racial offenses, which would have been being in partnership with a Jewish lawyer. Um, it would have been representing a Jewish client. And by the way, there would have been a lot of Pete Germans, non-Jewish Germans, who were working with Jewish clients, and especially who were working with Jewish lawyers, because at the eve of, world, of, of the Nazis' accession to power, roughly 50% of the bar in the city of Berlin was Jewish. 50%, 5-0. Nationally, it was something more like 24%. Why is that? Well, it has something to do with the way in which the doors opened in the 19th century to new people coming into uh, the ability to be, uh, to be lawyers. So now picture yourself, picture yourself as a lawyer, a non-Jewish lawyer, maybe a member of that war generation, or maybe a, maybe a wounded World War I vet. You're making half of what a bricklayer makes. You believe that uh, that you may well believe that the Jews were at least partly responsible for the demise of the Reich, former Reich. Uh, and someone comes along who is offering a program that will reduce or eliminate the competition from Jewish lawyers. If you're a lawyer in Berlin, getting rid of the 50% of the lawyers that are Jewish is going to help you put bread on the table which is something that you're not currently doing. So what then happens? What One thing that happens importantly in 1935 is the passage or the, the announcement, I guess you'd say, of the Nuremberg Laws. These are laws that are announced at a rally in Nuremberg rather spontaneously because Hitler felt that he was having these big rallies. These are the rallies that you see in the Leni Riefenstahl films, if you've ever seen uh, any of her work from that time period, you know, these extraordinary fascist displays of rows upon rows of soldiers and the flags and the banners and all of that stuff. So he's got this big rally. He decides he needs something big to announce. And so this is a moment where really very much at the last minute, he decides that he wants to make an announcement of these laws that we now call the Nuremberg Laws. Chiefly, they're about citizenship. They're about redefining who can be a member of the German body politic. Uh, and eliminating Jews from citizenship, to turning them from citizens to something called dependents of the state, Staatsangehörige. So that's, that's uh, an important thing. They also have, to do, the Nuremberg Laws have to do as well with intermarriage, the ability of Jews and non-Jews to marry. They have to do with laws about 
sexual relations between Jews and non-Jews. They strip from Jews the ability to display the national flag. But centrally, they're about citizenship. Uh, as I said, um, how is it that these laws get enforced? Well, they're going to be enforced, they're going to be implemented, they're going to be interpreted by lawyers. Um, this is a chart that actually shows the way in which uh, the Nuremberg laws defined who was a Jew. It was done by the number, chiefly by the number of grandparents you had who were Jews. So you can see here, uh, you know, just very roughly, if you have four Aryan grand, uh, grandparents, uh, you are not Jewish. On the other end, if you have four Jewish grandparents, you certainly have you, if you're, you know, you with here are the four little segments of you, all four of them are Jews. Now here they're showing uh, somebody marrying uh, a, a, an Aryan. And so what do you do with their offspring? How, how do you treat them? Are they Jews or are they, are they not Jews? Um, in the middle, you have, if you have three Jewish grandparents, you're still a Jew. If you have two Jewish grandparents, uh, you're then something called a Mischling or a mongrel or a mixed person uh, of the first degree, and there are separate rules governing that. If you have just one Jewish grandparent and three Aryan grandparents, then you're a Mischling of the second degree and various, uh, you know, disqualifications and disabilities fall on you and your progeny as a result of that uh, status. So it really is quite, uh, you know, it's quite something. So here, you know, first degree Mischling, if you have two Jewish grandparents, um, a marriage between the, the grandson or, or granddaughter of that lineage with a, an Aryan uh, is only permitted with, with special permission. Uh, over here, if you've got three Jewish grandparents, you've got a, then a Jewish person marrying a half-Jewish person, then you have this offspring, and uh, that, is, that marriage is forbidden, forbidden right? So that's th that, these are the laws that are now being um, applied. This is a document that I chose to represent the Aryanization process. It's a personal document. It's another one from my family's records. My great uncle, my father's father's brother, Leopold, lived in a little town in uh, northern Bavaria called Kissingen. He owned a store, a clothing store. And this is the bank statement that reflects the final transaction that, under which his store was voluntarily sold to a non-Jewish person, a guy named Grome. Uh, it was voluntarily sold about three weeks after Kristallnacht, when he was arrested by the Gestapo and thrown into prison. Uh, and it was at a time when uh, uh, the, the forcible transfer of um, property from Jews to non-Jews was becoming uh, compulsory. So uh, that's what it looked like. Well, who's, you know, who's doing these, tra these are transactions. This is transactional law, who's doing these transactions? It's lawyers, it's, it's, and it's private lawyers. It's people out in Bad Kissingen, right? It's people out in the hinterlands. It's not, it's not mass crazy masterminds in Berlin. And then finally, finally, when we think about complicity once again, so we have, you know, I've given you the example of the Nuremberg Laws and their implementation, the Aryanization rules and their implementation. And then of course we get to lawyer complicity and the final solution as well. Over here on the left, uh, is uh, the drawing room of a very, very beautiful villa on the Wannsee, uh, which is a lake, a gorgeous lake in far western Berlin, um, a very leafy, very wealthy uh, suburb of Berlin. Uh, and this is the villa at which, in January of 1942, a group of 15 men came together, convened by Reinhard Heydrich, who was uh, the head of the Reich Security Office. Um, within the SS, they came together to ratify what we call the final solution to the Jewish question. That is to say, the mass industrialized slaughter of Europe's Jews. Over here on the right, you can see a document that was prepared to help them in their deliberations, tallying the number of Jews who were within the countries that the, that the Germans um, already controlled or expect that they would soon control and those in other places 
uh, that they did not yet control where there would have to be some kind of diplomatic negotiations unless the Nazis were able to completely take over. You see they total up uh, 11 million Jews. Um, and uh, what happens at this meeting is, of course, agreement security office under Reinhard Heydrich will be the, the, the organizing bureaucratic body that will have ultimate responsibility for carrying this into execution. There were men there from all of the different ministries that would have had some role to play transportation. Uh, well, actually, the, the railroad wasn't there for other reasons, but the interior ministry, the Reich Chancellery, the um, the, the, the um, foreign ministry, right? These are so all of these, these, but these are not, these are not names you've ever heard of with the exception of this guy, Adolf Eichmann. He's the only one you've probably heard of. He was there as an assistant to the convener of the meeting, which was Heydrich over here on the right. Uh, Eichmann ran the Jewish desk for Heydrich. So you've got here all of these men who are sitting around a table over by, it was, so the, the, the record, the protocol of the meeting makes clear that the, they held their meeting and then they had a lovely catered lunch um, after agreeing to the mass slaughter of 11 million, hopefully for them, 11 million people. Uh, and I just want you to see that of the men around that table, lawyers. All of those men had law degrees. And all of them are sitting around over schnapps, participating in the ratification of a plan for the mass industrial execution of upwards of 11 million people. It's very hard, I think, to identify in any way, certainly with a man like Heydrich, or the man that I introduced to you earlier, Rudolf Lange, who was there. He flew in from, where is he? Uh, there he is. He flew in from Riga. He li literally, he like put the weapons down that they were using to shoot people into pits, got on a plane and flew to Berlin to attend this meeting. Very, very difficult, I think, to identify in any way with that sort of monster. But I wanna end the talk by sharing a few details with you about this person, who I think is much more challenging, much more challenging for us to think about. His name was Bernhard Lösner. He worked for the Interior Ministry starting in 1933. He became, within short, shortly within arriving at, uh, uh, at the Interior Ministry, he was assigned to what they called the Jewish desk. Uh, and uh, the way that happened, according to him, and there's, there's corroborating evidence for this, was rather by happenstance. He had no special expertise in or a special loathing of Jews when he got to the interior ministry. But that was where, the, uh, that was where there was an open job, right? The, the, so it's, it's late 1933. All of these laws affecting Jews are starting to be uh, applied. and. All of these complaints and problems and dilemmas are being brought to the interior ministry around all of this new Jewish regulation. So there's this big pile of files on the, the de in the office, the cubicle that's for Jewish stuff. So his boss, Wilhelm Stuckart, says, go over to the take, would you clear, the, just get that stuff done, please. So he goes over, he becomes the head of the Jewish desk at the interior ministry. He is there all the way until 1943, but let me tell you what happens between 33 and 43, because I think it's troubling and interesting. He uh, is sitting in, it's, it's, no, it's uh, November of 1935. He is out for drinks with some of his ministry friends after a long day at work. When he gets a summons, from Berlin, it's from, from Nuremberg. The Nuremberg rally is about to begin, and they've decided that they want to announce these Nuremberg laws, what we call the Nuremberg laws, about German citizenship and Jews and intermarriage. They haven't prepared it. 
So they send for him. He gets this message from his boss in Nuremberg. We need you. Get down here. We're going to send a plane for you. We're going to send you your own plane. And we need you down here in the room advocating for the interests of the interior ministry. We need you to do the drafting along with representatives of the party and a couple of other ministers. So the guy's like 32 years old. He gets a call. He's the Fuhrer is calling. Needs him in Berlin, in, in Nuremberg. So he gets on the plane. He flies down. He spends two or three sleepless nights in a room sending, you know, typing up drafts of possible ways of defining who's a Jew, sending it off to the, the big, the top brass. It comes back all, you know, red line. Oh, they don't like this. They like that. All right, let's see if we can do this. Well, let's, oh, I, the party wants this, but I, the interior, I'm from the interior ministry. There's jockeying for power between agencies, just like we see in all governments. And he participates in the writing of the Nuremberg Laws. And you might think, how awful. And you'd be right. But he was there advocating for a more restrictive definition of who was a Jew. The party was there, and they wanted a one-grandparent rule. They wanted anyone who had one grandparent to be, uh, to be deemed Jewish and subject to all of the then existing restrictions. The ministry, the interior ministry thought that would be a nightmare. Why? Well, because think of the, the more Jews there are in Germany, the more people there are who are married to Jews in Germany or have a favorite uncle who is a Jew in Germany or who have a brother or a sister-in-law who's a Jew in Germany or a parent who's a Jew, or a business partner who's a Jew, the more of those there are, the broader the impacts will be on German society of imposing these restrictions. Law of divorce is gonna be complicated by these. The more Jews there are, the more married Jews there will be. The more problems the interior ministry will have. Think about child custody battles, inheritance. Think of the network of laws that emanate from the question of whether a person is a citizen of Germany or is in this disfavored group. So Bernhard Lersner is there, he's duking it out for a more restrictive definition. He, the ministry department, would prefer a rule that said you needed three Jewish, grand, three Jewish grandparents in order to be qualified as a Jew. And in fact, they more or less prevail over the party. The party does not get their one grandparent rule instead the rule is more um, restrictive in terms of who counts as a Jew under the, uh, under, the, under the laws. He continues along in the office. He continues with various aspects of Jewish policy, usually in an adversarial relationship with the party, the Nazi party, uh, and with the SS, uh, which are the much more bloodthirsty, I guess you'd say, um, um, groups towards the Jews. Uh, he's still there in 1942, when word begins to leak back from the Eastern Front of forced emigration was actually mass murder. He learns, and again, this is, most of this comes from his own memoir, so it's a bit suspect, um, but there is corroboration of, from other sources of a number of these points. He learns definitively that this euphemism of evacuation and migration was actually murder. And so he goes into his boss, Stuttgart, the interior minister, and says, I can't do this anymore. And he says, what do you mean you can't do this anymore? This has been authorized by the Fuhrer. And Lersner says, he touches his heart and he says, I have to answer to a higher authority. And Stuttgart blows up at him. You've never been any good. You've been a problem since you got here. Your problem is you're not aggressive enough. You always let the other ministries get out ahead of us. You were not proactive. You, you, just, you, 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 you don't know how to function in this bureaucracy. You're not aggressive enough on behalf of your ministry. Get out of here. And so he transfers him to some obscure tax office. Does he send him to Dachau? Does Bernhard Lersner end up with a bullet in his head? No. 
because you didn't necessarily uh, uh, and, and suffer that. I mean, he took a career hit, but did he take a, uh, an existent, was it existentially threatening to him? No, it wasn't. So he steps out when he learns that this has become genocide, and he is not punished for that. He ends up actually giving harbor to one of the um, conspirators in 1944 against uh, Hitler's life. And he is then therefore incarcerated, but not shot uh, for the remainder of the war when he is uh, liberated of sorts by American forces when they come through. So that's the story of what are we to do with Bernhard Lerner? I know what to do with Rudolf Langer. I don't, I, I, don't worry, I don't have trouble with that. I have trouble with this guy. I have trouble with this guy. I don't know how to categorize him. I mean, I do in some sense. Obviously, he was, he was in, a, in, in the big picture, deeply complicit in an outrageous, immoral system. But when you think about him and his choices and what he knew and why he did what he did, what was motivating him, I think maybe, just maybe, you can see some of the same kinds of things that touch us in our own professional lives. When we get the big call from the big boss up in the top you know, floor of the office, in the corner office, we need you. We need you for this important task. Oh my God, the boss is calling. They're sending a plane for me. I'm 32 years old, this is awesome. Wow, my career is zooming here. I am on the way up. That's, I think, something that we can recognize. That fighting for priority with other people who are, have a hand in a decision, I think is something that we can recognize from our own lives. So this is the point where I say, I go back to Sarah Fabian. I go back to Sarah Fabian arguing to the Ninth Circuit that safe and sanitary conditions do not include a toothbrush. And I invite you, and I'm going to stop now and invite you <laughs> to actually think about what is it that got her there. It wasn't why she went to law school. How does she get there? And by extension, how do we get where we are? How do we end up, or can we end up, in the systems of which we are a part or might someday be called upon to be a part? I hope that I've persuaded you at least that this is not just an invocation of Godwin's law, right, the analogy to Nazis, but that this is an instance in which thinking about the lives of ordinary Germans can help us meaningfully think about our own choices as professionals today and tomorrow. Thanks a lot for listening. I appreciated your attention, and I'm here for at least 15 minutes, I think, to, for discussion. It can be questions. It can be reactions. It doesn't have to be a one-way conversation. And we have our little bouncy ball microphone, too. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you go back to the beginning part and, and tell me, uh, in 1935, the lawyer had a conscience Hold it closer to your mouth. Yeah, well, the lawyer in 1935 had a conscience yeah. and a, a principle and went to uh, uh, defend a Jewish uh, this person or whatever. Uh, this is after the laws were enacted. Uh, what would be the outcome of that lawyer? Would he, would he be disbarred? There, there were a range of censures that could have been imposed on him. Uh, very, very different depending on the circumstances and the location. It could be that he would be censured by the local bar. Um, it could also be, it was also, there were cases of individuals who represented Jewish clients and who were then themselves incarcerated, not, not sent to death camps, but were sent to pretty miserable concentration camps and sort of everything in between those alternatives. All of those were possible outcomes depending very much on the idiosyncrasies of the individual. What I'm trying to get at is what are the choices for that person at that time, given the, uh, you know, what uh, coming from, down from Berlin. Oh, well, so, you know, if you are in, if you're in a ministry that's involved with implementing these laws, you have the, the basic dilemma 
um, that I think, again, not making a direct analogy, but that I think many lawyers and other professionals in the government today have. Do I stick around and try to temper these laws, or do I leave and express my own unwillingness to collaborate and to participate? You could probably do that. You wouldn't have been, you wouldn't have been sent to Dachau for leaving your government ministry job to go into private practice in 1936. Um, so that's the dilemma, right? Do I stay and try to temper with my conscience or does my conscience send me out knowing of the risk that the next person that they put into my little desk here is going to be a monster or more of a monster than I am anyway. Those were, those were the range of choices that people had and they made, you know, people made different choices, but by and large people complied. People stayed with it rather than leaving. Other questions or reactions, comments? Thanks. So one one thing I'm curious about is um, the way you sort of explained this guy's story yeah. was um, that he was really advocating for, like, think of the implications. This would cost a lot of money. It didn't sound at first that he really cared too much about the people involved. And then maybe once he realized, like, oh, this is really messed up, then he left. I'm curious um, of the extent of maybe legal professionals who along the way actually acted sort of like you were just explaining to say, these laws, if implemented, are extreme human rights abuses. I want to come in and limit it for that sake rather than advocating, I guess, for the bureaucratic um, interests they represented. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, there is little evidence that there's no evidence that Bernhard Lozner was a philo Semite, right? So he was not motivated by some sort of human rights-based desire to protect individuals from a Jew, Jews from oppression. It was a much more practical, governmental, bureaucratic office kind of opposition. But on the other hand, let me mention to you uh, another German lawyer uh, who's an interesting bookend with Bernhard Loesner in a certain way. His name was Hans Kallmeier. He was uh, something of a free, about the same age as Loesner, something of a free spirit, um, never joined the Nazi party, um, but he was conscripted into the Wehrmacht, and so he went off to the front and was traumatized by the idea of being at the front. So he pulled a lot of strings with his family. He came from a very prominent family. He pulled a lot of strings, and he got, him, he got an office job. He was transferred to occupied Holland, where he was responsible for the office that adjudicated contested cases about whether people were Jews or were not Jews. Uh, and what he did was bent the rules every conceivable way he could think of to find people not to be Jewish in cases where there was a plausible argument or a plausible argument could be manufactured. So he did lots of stuff and had his office do lots of things you know, accepting affidavits that somebody's not Jewish from people that maybe didn't really know, um, accepting claims of uh, that um, all of a sudden there was this rash of people who announced that in fact their children were not the product of their own marriage, their husband or wife, but that was with the, was, was with the non-Jewish postman. Right, so this wave of people who are trying to avail themselves of this definition of how many grandparents you have by saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, this isn't my husband's kid, this is, this is actually the postman's kid and mine, right? Um, or vice versa, it was men and women in, in both directions. Um, he went out of his way to honor those where they seemed plausible. So he, I think, out of an understanding, because at this point the Jews, it was clear that the Jews of, of Holland were being taken from, you know, Amsterdam to a concentration camp called Vesterbork where they were being prepared for ultimate transit to Poland. He, I think, on rather more clearly humanitarian grounds, stayed in the system and manipulated law where he could to protect individuals. Here's the interesting conundrum, though. We like Hans Kallmeier. Hans Kallmeier seemed to be operating creatively, um, exercising his discretion in his job to do what he could on a case-by-case -case basis, he ended up saving probably 5,000 
Dutch Jews. Mm, there's some disagreement about the number, but let's call it 5,000. Bernhard Lozner, who was not in any way operating from humanitarian grounds, but was operating entirely on practical grounds, efficiency grounds, ministerial grounds, saved tens of thousands of German and Austrian Jews, maybe more, by tenaciously advocating over time for a more restrictive definition of who was a Jew. How are we to think of those two people? On one hand, we might say Kalmeyer is the admirable person because he saved 5,000 people on uh, admirable moral grounds. And in fact, he is, the, the, the Israeli Knesset confers some, an, uh, uh, um, not an award, that's the wrong word for it, a designation on non-Jews who saved Jews during the war. They're called righteous Gentiles. Very rigorous process of selection. Um, and he was named. Um, uh, Kalmeyer is, one, is a righteous, righteous Gentile for saving 5,000 people. Nobody has ever suggested making Bernhard Lerzner a righteous Gentile. But the paradox, of course, is that he saved many-fold times the number of individuals compared to Kalmeyer. So it's a complicated question, morally complex question, I think. Great Others? question, great answer, Lori. First of all, thank you so much for this um, talk. Um, I'm speaking from a social work perspective. Um, we have um, somewhat of a similar history, very locally in our state, of having um, not just been complicit, but actively advanced the eugenics agenda of yes. our state um, mm -hmm. in up until not that long ago, really. And I guess my question that I am grappling with is, understanding the historical context that at that time we felt that eugenic practices were were scientifically beneficial, based yeah. yeah and 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 beneficial and understanding the deep humanity of all of the social workers who did this where is our accountability now as social workers as faculty who are teaching a new, the next generation of social workers um, living in a state where um, that legacy is is by no means gone, and how I, I'm just curious about. I don't know that there's an answer to that, but I'd be curious to know well, your thoughts. I mean, I have a thought or two, but do you? I, I mean, it's, this sounds like something you think about. I yeah, so, <laughs> indeed. So can you share with us how you how you think about that? How you try to uh, attain that that educational end? Yeah, it's, it's something that I'm working very hard on with my students right now. Um, and um, there's something in there about um, not hiding from the very devastating harm that we did, um, not hiding behind um, sort of um, uh, the guise of professionalism or um, historical context. Um, there's something to me, and, and I, I, I'm just working to articulate this, yeah. about um, committing ourselves to sort of rooting out where the eugenic mindset is still alive in our social policies. Um, because even though the, the laws are off the books, um, that mindset is alive and well. Um, and how, how do we even define what that mindset is and commit ourselves to um, to addressing it, and that's kind of where I am on it right now. Well, I, I'm kind of where you are. Um, <laughs> I mean, my answer goes in a similar direction. Um, to me, the questions about how we judge individuals in our history is valuable, but in some ways too easy. I think that when we look back and we say, that was a bad person, we, we let ourselves off. We, 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 turn, we turn yesterday's perpetrators into an other. We're not like them. We're fine. They were bad. They were racists. They were whatever. Um, I think the much harder question is uh, to think about the position of the profession in the larger discourse that's going on around policy. And to remind people to put, you know, it's so easy. We all know in, in our work, in our lives, in our careers, in our professions, it's so easy for your gaze to go down to the task in front of you. 
and so hard for it to stay up. And also it's very easy, I think, to fall into the trap of what we call, you know, what philosophers call role morality, right? Well, I would never do this, but I'm a lawyer and lawyers are, lawyers are allowed to do this, so I'll do this. I won't be troubled, I won't think about whether this is something I want to do, whether this is the person I want to be, because I have this thing called lawyer, and that thing called lawyer says that this is permissible. And so I'll do that thing. So I think reminding yourself, cultivating, this is, this is, this is the sort of the, the, you know, the black lights and crystals portion of the program, but you know, <laughs> uh, cultivating a practice of self-awareness um, that in which, you, in which you remind yourself to attend to the questions you're avoiding, that you feel that you're avoiding, um, that you pay attention to where you're troubled rather than look away from where you're troubled. That's, I think that's our best hope. Um, to me, the harder question is this dilemma, you know, do you stay in or do you leave? I mean, I just think that, you know, that's, that's a perennial problem um, that uh, I don't think there's a clear right answer to. So I hope that's responsive to your question. Thank you. I'm uh, mindful of our time and um, I want to thank everybody for making the time to come and I want to continue the conversation out over refreshments. Eric, I can't thank you enough for uh, the heart and mind and effort and, um, and critical thinking that you've brought to the task and that you've brought to us um, today. And I know this is going to be the begin beginning of many conversations um, to take this forward and to think about how it applies in our lives. So thanks for the opportunity. My gratitude. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.